Dean Rutherford, uh, honor to be here. Appreciate the invitation. I think I've got about 30 minutes. And then let's take some, some Q&A as well. I thought I'd outline our views of the 2014 election, talk about the strategies that we're employing, maybe get a little bit of advice from some of you about the Arkansas uh, Senate race, because I think that this race will help determine a majority in the United States Senate. But I want to talk about first, um, you know, how we find ourselves in the 2014 election from a macro perspective as a country and not from a party perspective and the challenges that we face in the business community here in Arkansas, uh, but also nationally to bring people together. And it's notable uh, that we're here at the Clinton School uh, because President Clinton uh, is somebody that had the ability to win a political election, but the courage to do something and work with both parties when he got there because that's what Arkansas is about. That's what being a governor in a southern state is about is reaching across the aisle and talking about the commonality and the things that you're for, if it's 60%, if it's 70%, instead of fighting about the 8% where you may disagree. And I'll talk about that in particular as it relates to this so-called war in the Republican Party between aggressively inflexible conservatives who are, I believe are increasingly anti-business and some of our friends in the Democratic Party who I think need to exert greater influence to change some of the policies that have been put forth by people like Harry Reid and people like Nancy Pelosi and this administration, in my opinion, very different from uh, when President Clinton was in office and some of the things that he was able to do that were very favorable to the business community here in Ar Arkansas, but also nationally when you look at things like welfare reform. My first boss out of college was Newt Gingrich. Uh, you know, I started for, at 7.50 an hour in the mailroom, and he preached that message every day. Uh, even when I was 22, 23 years old, and he said, listen, I'm going to disagree vigorously with this president politically, but I am going to work vigorously in order to find the things that we're for, because at the end of the day, it's about governing. And I think that from an economic perspective, and we can sort of also tip our hat to some of the things that are going on in the foreign policy arena right now, and are certainly with, with the challenges with the Ebola virus, I think that this country at the federal level needs to exert greater influence and provide more confidence to the American people. Right now, Washington is viewed in a historically unpopular way. It's measured by what it can't do. Credit is given by how hard and how loud and how often you can say no, rather than being proud about the things that you're able to accomplish with the opposite party. And so, fundamentally, our goal in 2014 is to reestablish a governing middle in the United States House and the United States Senate. And the best indicator that I've been able to find so far in terms of the polarization of both political parties is an analysis that National Journal has done every single uh, two and six years respectively, uh, measuring the House and the Senate on issues important to the business community, broadly defined, not partisan issues. And in 1982, in President Reagan's uh, first term, 90% uh, of the members of the House and 90% of the members of the Senate were within 10 percentage points of the middle. And that means that Democrats from Arkansas Democrats from my home state of Georgia were rated as more conservative than Northeastern Republicans from places like New York and places like Pennsylvania and places like Vermont. And in every two and six years respectively since 1982, that mass in the middle, that common sense governing mass in the middle has turned into a Q-tip where literally there is one member of the Senate that's within 10 percentage points of the middle and only 11 members of the House out of 435 where the same is true. And so what that has created, and redistricting is to blame, party leadership in both parties is to blame, but what that's created is in the Republican Party, it's no longer about winning an election in November, it's about avoiding a primary in March. It's about making sure that you are more conservative, and so you have to say things and do things, and I, the word rational in politics doesn't always, there isn't always a lot of symmetry between those two words, but it is somewhat of a rational political decision from a campaign perspective. If you're in a 65% Republican district, you're not worried about November, you're worried about April. And so you're gonna say things about Obamacare, you're gonna say repeal, you're gonna say no, you're gonna say impeach the president, some of these folks. And fundamentally what that does is it marginalizes you once you get there and you begin to govern because you can't reach across the middle because you've already boxed yourself in. And if you try to go to the middle, then the next Republican that's gonna file against you is gonna say, aha, they didn't do what they said they're going to do. Now, all of a sudden, they're moderate. Uh, and I find that to be very interesting. And Austin talked about the race in Mississippi, and I want to mention that one, and also a race in Alabama to provide a specific example of, of how the words conservative have been twisted and changed in a way that I think 
limits uh, the ability for some of these candidates to be effective when they get there. And so that's a, that's a real challenge. So what we decided to do uh, after the last election is learn from the mistakes that we made. And in the House, we landed about where we thought we would be in a presidential cycle, but in the Senate, it was a disaster by every measure. We lost almost every single race in really important states. And the first thing that we recognized when we did the after action analysis, and seeking input from state and local chambers, my friend Jay Cheshire, good to see you, pal, um, you know, is, is solicit the input and say, candidates matter, let's find the right people in both parties to run for office that have the ability to win an election, but the courage to do something once they get there and have a consequence and a result. So we spent the better part of our time in the off year recruiting candidates and having conversations with families in living rooms and talking about, here's the personal impact of what it means to run for federal office. Here's the financial commitment that you need to make. And if I haven't scared you away after those two conversations, then we're gonna have a conversation about what it means to run a campaign. What are the nuts and bolts of running a campaign? That's the job that I had at the RNC, traveling to 38 states, often to Arkansas with my friend Terry Benham as well. Uh, Terry, always great to see you as well. Uh, and learning what it means to run local races. And my footprint has always been on working with state chambers, working with local chambers, and figuring out how we can add value in the policy arena. But we can't do that unless we have the right people in the chairs in Washington. So we have this interesting dichotomy where at the state level, places like Arkansas, where as I recall last time I looked, Governor Beebe has the highest approval rating of any governor in America because he is able to work with members of both parties, work constructively with the business community, Maybe not agree on every issue, but be able to live to fight another day and work together for the betterment of the state. And that's the opposite of what's happening in Washington right now. So the first thing that we said is, we would normally wait until Labor Day, raise as much money as we can, wait till voters are beginning to pay attention, and then vigorously engage with endorsements, vigorously engage with independent expenditures, spend a lot of money to inform the voters where the candidates stand and let the chips fall where they may. And what we learned after the 2010 election with our friends in the Republican Party. What we learned certainly after 2012 is we no longer have the luxury to wait for the electorate to mature. We no longer have the, the luxury to wait to figure out who gets through the primary. We spent, private number, we spent $20 million this primary season in 15 races, two special elections, and the 13 uh, primaries where there was a distinguishing characteristic on business issues and where we fundamentally felt that we could change the electorate and we were successful, we were lucky, lucky first, <laughs> in 14 out of 15 of those races. And the one that we lost was a runoff in Georgia where the man that got through uh, is someone that we disagree with on a number of issues, but uh, Mr. Purdue in Georgia, it's a former CEO of Reebok and is a, fundamentally gonna be a, a good vote for the business community's perspective. So we have to figure out when you're dealing with a Republican runoff or a Republican primary in a Southern state like Alabama or like Mississippi, how does the business community be relevant? How can we grow the electorate? How can we appeal to people in a debate where the debate in the Republican primaries has been who's the most conservative? But factor in, you all know this, we support comprehensive immigration reform because it's the right thing to do for a whole host of reasons. We support reauthorizing the XM Bank. We support Common Core and allowing there to be standards. We support a transportation funding mechanism to make sure that roads and ports and bridges and broadband work because it's the tabletop of our economy. Those aren't issues necessarily that neatly lend themselves to Republican primaries when the discussion and the debate is who's going to be tougher on the president, who's going to be tougher on taxes or spending or Obamacare and those things. So let me give you one example that I think I learned a lot from and I think that we learned a lot from that I think is an empowering message as we talk about moving forward in this next Congress, and then into the next presidential debate, and it is Alabama. So Alabama won. This is a special election that occurred last uh, November 8th. Uh, this was Mobile, Alabama. This is the 11th largest port in America. The I-10 bridge go, I goes right through it, and the I-10 bridge goes through it. And Congressman Bonner decided to retire and took a, took a new job, so we had an open seat. And we had a man named Bradley Byrne, who was a state senator, Republican, who was a conservative man, supported education reform, uh, had just run for governor in the primary in 2010 and lost by 5,300 votes, running against a man named Dean Young, who makes Todd Aiken look like a Northeastern liberal. Dean Young is so far to the right, he's to the left. I mean, this guy, this is somebody that would say things that just would be fundamentally embarrassing and unacceptable. 
And so we got into that primary, and then there was a runoff between those two individuals. And the debate and the narrative was Dean Young attacking the local business community for corporate welfare, attacking the business community in Alabama, the state chamber, our friend Billy Canary, the Mobile Chamber, our friend Wynn Hallett, who used to run, who used to be the chairman of all the, all the local chambers, great respected leaders in the state and nationally. And that was the frame of the debate. The establishment candidate, Bradley Byrne, the guy who lost the governor's race, who's moderate, who supports education reform. What a crazy idea that is. And, you know, versus Dean Young, who's the tested and true conservative. So there are 52,000 votes that happen. This is, we're talking about a, not a big group of people during the primary. And then when we got to the runoff, projections were that there were going to be 20,000 votes on a good day if there was no rain in Mobile. Uh, and we looked at the first poll, and the top issue was Obamacare. And there was a strong sentiment to repeal. There was even a, a significant number of people that wanted to impeach the president. I mean, this is a very conservative place. But we dug through the data. We talked with the folks at the state chamber. We talked with the folks at the Mobile Chamber, at the Birmingham Alliance. And what we did is we ran a sustained campaign, identified a universe of 100,000 people whose jobs were specifically and directly or their family's jobs were tied to that port personally, emotionally, directly, or were tied to the I-10 bridge in some form or fashion through the service sector, through the logistics. Um, and we were able to pound that universe of 100,000 people with social media, failing, learning, getting better, uh, direct mail and telephones on economic issues and proudly so. Those are the things that I talked about when I stood at the press conference. And we talked about immigration reform in a targeted manner as well. We were able to grow that electorate from 52,000 votes in the primary to 74,000 votes in the runoff. And Bradley Byrne won that election by four percentage points. If Bradley Byrne, this is the most important election that not everybody knows about. If Bradley Byrne would have lost that election, think about the timing. The filing deadlines for Illinois, the first in the nation, or December 8th through the 11th. Then goes Texas, then goes Ohio in January. So all of these candidates who wanted to emulate people like Senator Cruz, emulate on some issues, emulate uh, Dean Young in, in the Alabama example, they were all watching very carefully and, and saying, if I want to be elected to the Congress, what's my path to do it? And they looked at what had happened when Republicans squandered Senate seats over the course of the last two election cycles, five Senate seats, which would have made the Senate evenly divided today. And these candidates were looking, and they were beginning to raise money, and they were beginning to circulate and decide. If that election hadn't gone the right way, I think we'd be in a fundamentally different place right now. Republicans may well have held a, a majority in the House of Representatives, but what I not so affectionately refer to as the caveman caucus, these are the people on the far, far right in the House of Representatives who want to shut down the government and see the business community as, as the problem, we learned a lot to have the confidence, not just to talk about issues that work politically in a poll, but to be able to use the political time to lay the predicate for what you're for in the governing time. That's how you reestablish the middle, because you can point back when the elections are over and say, no, 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 we litigated this, and the people in your state and the people in your district had a voice, an overwhelming voice on these issues. So what we're starting to see is in places like Iowa, the XM Bank is one of these sort of tricky issues that not a lot of voters understand or it's not necessarily a vote determinant issue. But we have Republicans that are running for the Senate that proudly will stand at the podium when I do the endorsement events and they say, yeah, I do support comprehensive. I do support immigration reform. It's going to take a little bit of a form or a different shape depending upon the state that you're in. But what the political program of the chamber is intended to do is not be a political partisan hammer it's intended to be a consequence for voting the right way or not with the business community, but it's, see, it's also sought to be an empowering force to give wind and give momentum connected with the state and the local chambers to have a consequence and a policy result when we move past this. And we know, President Clinton taught us, the big things that last in Washington, as I said when I open, are always done on a bipartisan basis. So in this particular election, the House is almost certain to stay Republican, and the majority is almost certain to grow. The Senate, we'll talk about here in a minute, is probably, because of math, going to flip to be Republican. Let's just say it's 51 or 2 votes that the Republicans 
uh, get in the Senate when, when the dust settles after the election and after the runoffs. In 2016, there are 24 Republicans that are up for election and 10 Democrats. And every Democrat comes from a state that President Obama won. So when the next president is sworn in in January of 2016, and we're looking at the first 100 days of the next president, we are almost certain, barring there's plenty of things that can happen, but we are likely, in my opinion, to have a divided House, a House that's Republican, a Senate that's Democrat, and a president will figure that out over the course of the next couple of years. I believe it's going to be the most consequential time for economic issues in, in, in the last three decades because there is an imperative for both political parties to solve these problems. Solve these problems with regard to this health care law. It's not going to be repealed. The president is going to repeal his own signature piece of legislation, and the next president's very unlikely to do so as well. How do we fix it? We know the things that need to be done. Energy policy, this is a situation where Democrats and Republicans agree in the legislative arena and also from the regulatory space that energy is the fastest way to create jobs in this country. The financial services bill, Dodd-Frank, we think is deeply flawed, but we have to create certainty for the financial markets, big banks, community banks, small banks, everything in between. We have to fix those issues, and then certainly we can talk about labor policy as well. If Republicans are smart, and if Democrats who are in cycle in the next election, and, and candidates that are seeking the nomination of both political parties have courage, they will have a specific plan starting in January of next year to fix these four issues to start, maybe you throw trade into that as well. That's not even to mention the issues that are the real ones that we have to deal with. We have to reform the tax code, we have to deal with immigration reform, and we have to deal with entitlements, because if we don't deal with entitlements soon, these problems become intractable and the solutions are completely untenable. So we are seeking to find a way to reestablish that middle. I talked about the Republican Party, I think it's important also to talk about the challenges that we have in the Democratic Party and the opportunity that the next nominee in the Democratic Party has to reestablish a lot of President Clinton's legacy. Our threshold for endorsement is 70% for incumbents. If it's an open seat, I'll interview them, and we have a candidate questionnaire on many of the issues that I've just discussed. We went from 38 Democrats that we would endorse as recently as 2008, down to 21 Democrats in 2010, down to five Democrats last time, and two have retired. So it's hard to reestablish the middle if both political parties aren't coming to the table. At the state level, in Arkansas and other places, there are plenty of examples of Democrats coming to the table and being constructive on a number of different issues. North Dakota is a perfect example of what energy can do to help create jobs. And our friend, Kelvin Hullett and Andy at the state chamber in North Dakota, I went up and visited them a couple of times and just listened to what's happening with regard to the energy revolution. And this is a situation where North Dakota is a Republican state, but there are a lot of Democrats in senior leadership positions. Just consider this and they are blessed with their energy resources. There are counties in North Dakota that have 0.7% unemployment. They can't keep the McDonald's open for more than eight hours because they're paying their folks $25 an hour to work at McDonald's, but they're making six figures working in the ener energy industry. They can't, the problems that they have, they can't build the houses fast enough. They can't build the roads fast enough. They don't have enough hotel space. They don't have the restaurants. They don't have all the service industries that are connected to the driver of that particular economy. So it's an example of what happens when people come together and have a consequence. When I sat around the table and listened to their board of directors and listened to my friends in the Chamber Federation, they were frustrated because the growth wasn't happening. They, they couldn't keep up with the growth. And what were they going to do to spend the surplus that they had? They had a $200 million surplus up from $80 million projection last year. So these are sort of good problems to have. We can have that same opportunity at the federal level if we find candidates of both parties that have, again, the ability to win an election and the courage to govern. One of the things we've also learned, taking the lesson from Senator Tester in Montana last time we were talking about over with Austin and the dean at lunch, you know, you look at candidates like Senator Tester in Montana last time, also Senator Heitkamp in North Dakota, who was running uh, in that open seat election, you know, in, in those examples, you have, you have Governor Romney winning by 11 points and 14 points respectively in a Republican wave, and these candidates were able to swim against the tide because, and I call it the one of us test, you know, does this candidate share my values? Do they look and feel like me? Do they want the same things that I do? And Heitkamp and Tester were able to separate themselves from a wave election in a federal year where those states are overwhelmingly Republican. And Austin alluded to it uh, when he was introducing me, that's what we also employed 
in the state of Mississippi. Senator Cochran had been there and has been there for an incredibly long period of time. Bringing in Mitt Romney to run an ad to validate Thad Cochran in Mississippi is not going to work. <laughs> not going to work. Bringing in Jeb Bush, not going to work. It reinforces the narrative that he's been there too long and he's a Washington guy. So we went and found uh, Brett Favre, who is not a political person. Brett Favre has a 284-acre ranch, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Yes, he went and played the NFL, but he came home. Played for Southern Miss, but he came home and he lives there now. We were able to convince him, not on a public policy issue, we didn't sit with Brett Favre and say, well, you know, before we do this, we want to compare our, you know, our policy as it relates to the XM Bank and see if we can reach agreement. That wasn't the conversation. The conversation was, we want to help create jobs in your state. And the debate that's going on in this particular Senate race is making the state of Mississippi look bad. Not a party, not a candidate. It's reflecting upon the state. And you have, in our opinion, a unique opportunity to make your voice heard and convince Democrats, because it's an open primary, independents and Republicans to support the candidate that is best positioned to create jobs. But it was, it was more about jobs for Brett. It was more about to make your state respected and be, be viewed the right way. Mississippi has a long history, like Arkansas, of trusted leaders who have represented the state exceptionally well. And oh, by the way, it doesn't hurt that he was going to be the chairman of the Appropriations Committee if he were, if he were uh, uh, reelected and if Republicans take the Senate, which is not lost on many folks down in the port and in different places in Mississippi. So we're using Richard Petty in an ad in North Carolina that's up on TV right now, trying to do the same thing. Um, you know, I mentioned we use people like Mitt Romney. I laughed. Uh, in a Republican primary, same sort of situation as Alabama, same sort of situation as in Mississippi, in Idaho. Uh, Idaho is as conservative as they come. We ran an ad with, where, where our man, uh, Congressman Simpson, is 92% with the U.S. Chamber, A-plus with the NRA, National F uh, NFIB and others endorsed him, a number of other conservative groups. He, too, was being challenged from the right. Mitt Romney's favorability rating in Idaho, too, is 86% because of the Mormon population. 10% unfavorable, 86% favorable. And to show you how closely some reporters follow these races, there was a scathing article that came from Washington, D.C. that said, there goes the Chamber of Commerce, the face of the establishment, employing the failed face of the establishment from the last election, but they hadn't done the research to figure out that Mitt Romney was viewed 86% favorably. I've never seen that. If you're getting to 60%, that's a Chamber of Commerce day, 86%. So, the most, the, the thing that I value most and I'm most fortunate to do in my job is to work with state and local chambers. Most state and local chambers don't get involved in federal politics. Why would they? Same way we don't get involved in local legislation or local races. It's not our mandate. It's not what we're good at. But we can get advice and counsel. We can get you can be made aware of sensitivities and personalities and tone. And so the ability to take the learning, the knowledge, from state and local chambers on substance and on issues when we get past the political time to be able to link up with Randy or link up with Jay or with my friend Terry and talk about, look, you're never going to want to talk that way in Arkansas. You're never going to want to push that issue in the political time. But here's a quiet conversation that we can have that can make sure that you preserve your right to be able to get something done with that candidate should they be successful. So local messages matter. The, the lesson from 2006 and 8 and 2010 was, well, you need to nationalize the election. You need to, the river's flowing that way. You just need to say Obama and Medicare cuts and Obamacare and, and those candidates are going to go away. I think that the lesson in terms of making sure that we have candidates with the courage to govern is find the local issues and the national issues, but talk about the local impacts of those issues so that there's a clear distinction and voters know who's for jobs and who are the people that are consistently voting against those jobs. So that's been the crux of our effort this cycle. That's been our charge. It's not to elect Republicans. It's not to go against the Democrats. It's to find responsible Republicans and back them, find Democrats that we're going to endorse and vigorously support them, and also find Democrats that we're not going to be involved with politically, but Democrats that we can work with legislatively in order to have a result. And a lot of people don't, under, don't know, why would they, that we are, serve in a number of different coalitions with unions, particularly on transportation and infrastructure issues. We work very closely with this administration on trade issues. We wish they'd do a little bit more, but they are working in the right direction and we, we stand shoulder to shoulder and we work together. And the fact is, a lot of the issues that I've talked about today here at lunch are only gonna be solved on a bipartisan basis. If you ram through an issue on one party, the other party is not invested in, the, in its success. So they're only going to work against it. 
You have to find some split, some blend. And as I have cautioned a lot of the Senate candidates, many of whom I talk with every day, better make sure that if Republicans get the majority, it doesn't turn into a second grade soccer game where everybody runs to the ball with their own priority. Because then the president looks at the House and Senate and says, see, I told you that's exactly what they did when President Clinton was there. It's what President Clinton was able to do effectively to triangulate the Congress. I think we have an opportunity to have a serious debate in this country about what a serious jobs plan looks like that can be accomplished with both political parties. So to reflect for a moment on 2014 and where are we with 18 days left, who's counting? I am <laughs> every hour, clock next to my desk that literally goes down to the second. Um, redistricting has taken the House of Representatives from 95 races where the U.S. Chamber got involved in 2010, where there was a difference between the candidates on our issues and where the races were competitive, 95 races where we invested money. Redistricting last time after the 2010 elections took 95 races and shrunk them down to about 38 races. So when I talk about the National Journal example of, you know, polarization in the Q-tip, I need a better example, polarization, you know, it's also reflected and, and part of the reason is because of redistricting. So, redistricting. so we're down to 38 races. What's also interesting is a little less than half of those races are found in only three states, New York, California, and Illinois. So if those races in those deep blue states are going to rise and fall on a partisan basis, guess what? That's not very good news for the Republican Party. So that's where we have an opportunity and where we've spent our time and energy is not in the reddest of the red states. Where we've spent our time and energy and money is in states that are blue districts or districts that are purple districts where economic issues are at the forefront. In some of the bright red states, it's a national security debate about ISIS, or it's a social issue debate, or it's guns, whatever it may be, and that's fine. Those are all positions that other organizations involve themselves in, and we respect that. And it's fine for voters to have their own views. That's not what our charge is. We're down to 38 races that are competitive. In order for us to win in Massachusetts 6, this is the North Shore of, of Boston, this is a district that President Obama won by 14 percentage points. We have to find a way to move this discussion into a responsible discussion about which candidate is best positioned to create jobs. So we literally have 38 races to invest our money in, and that's it. Six of those are Democrats, where we are, we are vigorously involved and have endorsed and will begin spending money on their behalf. So the House, probably somewhere between a six and uh, ten seat net, I think, for the Republicans. When all the dust settles, if it's a you know, really great night, it might be, uh, I think, 12 seats. If Republicans net 11 seats, it'll be the largest majority since World War II. Uh, but they better make sure that the composition of that majority is focused on people that are uh, receptive to the free enterprise message and are interested in governing on these issues that I've discussed. The Senate, you know, we were talking also at lunch, over the course of the last five elections, Republicans have only defeated three Democratic incumbents, only three. Democrats have beaten 12 Republican incumbents in that same period of time. So beating and unseating an incumbent, if you're a Republican candidate, is a very, very difficult thing. And I think we're learning that here in Arkansas. I'll give credit to the campaign that, that Senator Pryor is running, because he has deep respect because of his family, deep respect because of what he's done for the state. Um, so the Senate is going to be exceptionally close. I think about the world in three different buckets. The first is uh, West Virginia, South Dakota, and Montana barring some dramatic occurrence, which we've seen that in the last couple of elections, are almost certain to go to the Republican Party. They need three more, the Republicans do, in order to take a majority. Arkansas will help determine what happens in that regard. Louisiana, there's going to be a runoff with Senator Landrieu in December. And then there's also Alaska. And Senate races in Alaska are very interesting because the population is so spread out, so diverse. People say it's a red state. It's might vote Republican at the state level, but it, Senator Begich is a Democrat. They've had Democrat governors, Democrat Governor Mr. Knowles. This is not a bright red state. I was up there three weeks ago. There was a 6.2 earthquake in the middle of our press conference. We had to evacuate the building and, and run outside with all the reporters. Interesting state there. And then there are four states to watch. Watch between now and the next 18 days, but I think watch in terms of what the analysis is when we get past this election and people start to talk about what does it mean for 2016. So I would draw your attention to these four states. And in this order, Iowa, uh, North Carolina, Colorado, and New Hampshire. All four of these states are presidential battleground states. Obviously, Iowa and, North Carolina, and New Hampshire are the first as it relates to the nominating process. 
So both the president's apparatus that he's had in place since 2007 in those states, as well as Hillary Clinton, spending a lot of time traveling to Iowa these days, I note. Uh, also, a lot of the folks that would be potential nominees, like Mitt Romney on the Republican side, Marco Rubio, Chris Christie, Rand Paul, go through the list, are circulating through each of these states to find a way to be relevant, to make the contacts, to, to figure out what the electorate's like and build relationships and, yes, raise money as well. If Republicans take the Senate, and they take the Senate with the first three states that I mentioned in Louisiana and Arkansas and Alaska, the Democrats are going to say, if Republicans can't win states that Romney won by double digits last time, then they ought to probably go home. But what's notable is in the four states that are going to determine or help determine the next president of the United States and the nominating process as well, if Democrats sweep all four of those states, that is a massive victory for the Democrats. That is a huge deal. And the state that I think matters more than any other is the state of North Carolina. North Carolina, since 2007, the Obama for President apparatus organization has invested more money than any other state on the presidential map, on the Senate map this time, with Colorado being uh, number two, New Hampshire is also considerable. The electorate is uh, favorable. This is a state that Obama won the first time, lost by one percentage point uh, to Romney in 2012. Uh, the demographics, the universities, the diversity of the eastern part of the state from that's more Democrat, the Republican part of the state, in the West, which is, uh, m which is more conservative on financial or on fiscal issues as well as on national security and social issues. Think about this. The outside groups in the Democratic Party put in $20 million. That's not counting the party. That's not counting the campaigns between September 1 and Election Day. And that's 10-day-old information. I'm sure it's up to $25 million now. $20 million. And I assume there's at least another 10 in there for the party and, and for the campaign as well. This is the firewall for this president's legacy on the political side. This is the firewall. If Democrats can win North Carolina consistently, <clears throat> Republicans won't win a national election. It's that straightforward if you look at the electoral map and you look at where the votes come from. Republicans have to have North Carolina. So that's the state to watch. The polls close at 7 o'clock. I'll be watching 7 o'clock on, on election night. But also consider. Iowa. This is a state that's been Democratic presidentially for a long time. Bush did win it in 2004. Also a very, very competitive race. And Scott Brown, the man who was the senator from Massachusetts who moved to New Hampshire, has been running a local campaign, township by township. And that race, he's down now only one percentage point. And the incumbent senator, Gene Shaheen, I like to call her Gene Shaheen, the taxing machine. The taxing machine is, is at 46, 47 percent in that survey. So. Those are the four races to watch very closely. Georgia, Louisiana, going to go to a runoff. So we may not know until the first week of, uh, you know, the first week of January, which way the Senate is going to go. And think about the idea of all the independent money and all the campaigning that will go on in my home state of Georgia, as well as Louisiana. If the Senate hangs in balance in one or two states across this country, it'll be a lot like the recount, not not as high a stakes as a presidential election, but considerable stakes. If the Senate is going to come down to one or two Senate states to determine who's going to get the gavel and how that's going to work. So I am um, cautiously optimistic and in that order <laughs> with regard to how this election is going to, going to turn out. But as I'm often reminded, victories and losses in Washington are never permanent. It's a, it's a, it's a, you have to remain vigilant on behalf of the issues that we care about. And I think we have a class of candidates this time that fit that mold, that have the ability to, to govern, have an ability to lead into that first 100 days of the next president. So we can get back to a place where we were looking at the House and the Senate as Americans and not as bitter rivals in the political space. Some of the best conversations that I've had, and I won't compromise names because you all know a lot of these people, some of, the most, some of the most interesting and respectful conversations that I've had in my 13 years almost with the U.S. Chamber have been involving this Senate race, where I recognize specifically how personal re the relationships are with Senator Pryor, uh, how deep th that goes, not just with him, but, but with his father and with his mother and what they've been able to do for the state. And, I, and, and we are respectful of that, and that's what I said at the press conference yesterday. I, I said that we have tremendous respect for him, we value and thank him for his service. We have a disagreement on some policy issues. Uh, and as one senior statesman from Arkansas told me 
uh, in his time. You know, you can disagree without being disagreeable. And, and that's something that I think President Clinton did an exceptional job of that we're trying to learn from as it relates to the issues that, that we're supporting in this particular election cycle. So with that, I will pause and take any questions that anybody may have. Sir. All right, let's see. Yeah, let's, let's wait till we get the microphones. Rob, thanks. Okay. Let's wait till we get the microphones. Uh, climate change costs the United States billions of dollars every year. I respect, as much as I disagree with uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the quote-unquote business community, I respect your rationalism and your attachment to the earth. Um, money, basically, which keeps everything going. Climate change costs us billions of dollars and also could provide um, millions of jobs and, and lots of possibility for revitalizing communities. Uh, what is the, the stance of the chamber and are you looking at moving towards a more environmentally friendly direction as a lot of the country is starting to do that? Well, I, I think that there's a lot of misinformation on climate change. And so here are the facts. The facts are right now you have Washington bureaucrats who know nothing about running companies. And some of the things that have been pr proposed, particularly through the Environmental Protection Agency, and the amount of time that they're giving corporations of all sizes to implement this, would mean that companies would be in non-attainment, meaning that they would not be able to exist under some of the guidelines and regulations that the Environmental Protection Agency has promulgated. So what that would do is kill, literally, by nonpartisan estimates, kill millions of jobs in this country. So our position is clear. It is an all of the above approach to energy exploration. We support solar, we support wind, we support uh, 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 natural gas. There's every single part of the mix that environmentalists think should be at the tip of the spear. We support that. We have members that, that are in each of those industries that have a seat at the table at our organization. The reality is those industries are not viable to go from being 7% of our energy blend today to being 80% of our energy blend in 15 or 20 years. It's not viable. It will kill jobs in this country. So this is an example where there are people on the far left that view this as a partisan, and I would go beyond partisanship, I would say an ideological argument. I think some of the arguments that, with all due respect, Vice President Gore have made are factually inaccurate and have led, for, led to a lot of misinformation. So our view is, you aren't going to have a diverse energy mix in this country to fuel where we're going to go if you don't bring everybody to the table. And the more that environmentalists want to castigate the nuclear in industry, to just use one example, we haven't built a nuclear plant in the United States of America since I was born in 1975. It's 20% of our mix. Do you know that France, the last time I checked, I think that it's 95 or 96% of France's <laughs> uh, energy uh, footprint. But you know, what's interesting with regard to that, we created a website called Project No Project, and that is, okay, you wanna build a, a solar, uh, you know, have a solar farm or you wanna have a wind farm? Uh, okay, let's do that. The problem, the people that are stopping that are not people in the business community, it's people in the environmental community who say, yeah, we should have more solar, we should have more wind. Just don't do it here in Massachusetts because I don't wanna see it when I'm looking off Cape Cod. You know, don't do it, you know, in this particular place, it's the NIMBY issue that comes into play. And so I think on energy issues in particular, what's, what are the facts? The facts are energy is the fastest way to create jobs in this country, period. And that's why a number of Democrats in the House and the Senate support construction of the Keystone XL pipeline, know that the Environmental uh, Protection Agency is completely out of control. So if we're gonna have a sober, factual conversation, our position has been quite clear. We want everybody at the table, but we have to have a reality check with regard to what our energy footprint is today, recognize that it absolutely needs to change. That's been our stated position, but we have to do it in a way that respects what's economically viable, not what is what people hope happens or what feels good. Okay, question, let's see. Yes, sir, back here in the red shirt, right? Here. Thank you very much for a, an enlightening presentation that gives me a sense of hope. However, and keeping emotion out of this, mm -hmm. I want to say that I was confused by your statement that we, this is a quote, are waiting for the electorate to mature. Now, as a member of the electorate, I watched the Republican Party espouse one public policy for four straight mm -hmm. years, get mm -hmm. rid of the seating president. Mm -hmm. So frankly, I've been waiting for our legislators 
to mature. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. What I meant mature, I didn't mean in that sense. I meant, I meant in the sense that we have to make sure that we're talking about issues that create more of a dimensional approach so it's not a single issue deal. That's what I was trying to explain as it relates to Alabama. I don't think it is mature, to use the Alabama example, or we could also talk about Mississippi, if the election is fought, rises and falls on a single issue. I don't think that that's healthy. That's why our threshold for endorsement is 70%. What I've been by mature is that's our responsibility to come in as a business community and say, just because healthcare works in a poll doesn't mean that that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to lay the predicate on a multi-dimensional basis about what we're for. Every mix of ads that we do in every press conference, there are generally six issues that we try to inject into the electorate to be able to say, look, we're not going to talk about social issues. We're not going to talk about national security issues. But on the economy, here are the things that we've listened and learned from to be able to say, voters have a choice. Candidate A stands on factually, has voted this way, and candidate B has voted the opposite way, and voters are going to make up their own mind as to where they stand on it. So the word mature meant we need to have a more robust discussion, and I'll go back to the energy deal as well. You know, if we're going to, if we're going to treat each other, not you and me, but th this debate is probably one of the hottest debates where I think there's tremendous misinformation on both sides of this issue. If we're not willing to go back to what I led with, which is have the courage to govern and do something, if people are going to sit on each side of the you know, room and yell at each other, we're not going to fix the energy issue. We're not going to deal with health care. And I think that what Republicans did, quite frankly, with regard to having, I don't know, 42 votes on repealing Obamacare, they marginalized themselves. And I think it's to the detriment of both political parties. As recently as 2004, about half the Americans viewed the Democrat and Republican parties favorably, and about half viewed them unfavorably. It was even higher in a good way, in a net basis, when President Clinton was here. Right now, both parties are at historic lows, which means they're not trusted messengers, so they can't credibly talk about any of those issues because they're viewed to just be focused on a single issue or a, a narrow set of issues that don't necessarily fall into our purview. Uh, yes, ma'am, right back here. Thank you, Mr. Engstrom, for covering a lot of points. Um, Thank you. Some of which were new to me. You finished your address um, by referring to Senator Mark Pryor and uh, the respect for him and his family in the state of Arkansas. Yes. My concern with his opponent is pulling in millions of dollars from the Cook brothers as they are doing in other states. To me, they are buying. They are trying to buy elections. What does the chamber have to say about that? I, I appreciate, thank you for coming and thank you for your question. I have um, the deepest respect for the Koch brothers and for what they've been able to do in this country. And this is a, a group of people that came together and created tens and ten, I think it's 60,000 jobs in this country. Uh, and to me, they're the definition of what's right in America as it relates to creating jobs. The uh, First Amendment allows us and the Koch brothers and a number of other people to participate vigorously in the political debate. Back to the gentleman's question, I trust the people of Arkansas and I trust the American people to decide what they value and what they don't value. The reality is, if you know, it, it, and it only works when both sides have an equal opportunity to have their voices heard. Mr. Soros in, in the Democratic Party has spent a considerably larger amount of money on behalf of Democratic candidates. Uh, Mr. Steyer on environmental issues has pledged $100 million out of his own, uh, 50 million from himself and 50 million from his colleagues to paint Republicans directly as, you know, anti-environment. Isn't it interesting that on a, this is just parenthetical, if you look at the places in America that are the most pristine in the national parks, they tend to be governed by conservatives. When you look at the places that are at non-attainment, the inverse tends to be true. So I think that, um, Every election, there's somebody that's trotted out as the boogeyman, as the reason for all things that are wrong. Um, I've met Mr. Cotton uh, in, in elections for the Senate and elections for the House th to suggest that somehow they're going to be beholden to one group of people or, or a couple of people. The unions come to the podium every cycle and they pound the podium and they say, we're going to spend $300 million to throw the Republicans out we might spend $50 million. If we want to add up all the money on both sides, I can tell you that conservatives would be underfunded by hundreds of millions of dollars. So I personally, I respect and appreciate what the Koch brothers have been able to do. I think it's a shining example of what's right in this country. Um, and I also respect and appreciate the right 
of the left and those folks in the Democratic Party, particularly in the governing coalitions, the trial lawyers, as well as some of the environmental folks, to vigorously participate also. I think, it's, I think that's good for the country. Yes, okay, sir. Right. Hi, my name's Sarah. I'm also a student here at the Clinton School. And like Austin mentioned, in our elections course, we're following specific races. The one that I'm following closely is the Kansas governor race, okay. which is interesting. And in so we've got Governor uh, Brownback, yep. obviously the incumbent, um, who passed some tax legislation that has caused him some trouble. Yep. And from a national perspective, so it's, it's at a pretty dead heat at the moment, but there's mm -hmm. a, a chance that the Democratic <laughs> candidate, Davis, will go ahead and take that. Yep. And there's a lot of speculation that that will kind of be a referendum on sweeping tax legislation yep. um, from the re Republican mm -hmm. perspective. I'm <clears throat> really curious the chamber's perspective on that race in particular for my own reasons, but also sure. looking at is that a referendum potentially or um, with regards to that kind of tax legislation? It's a great question. I was in uh, Topeka last Monday to endorse Senator Roberts. For those of you that aren't following the Senate race, let me start there and then go to governor because I think that they are linked and you're the expert on it, so I might want to grab you after the, after the deal. But Senator Roberts has been in the Senate for almost 30 years. Uh, he doesn't live in Kansas, which is a hurtful thing when you're trying to win re-election. He was quoted as saying, I only go home to Kansas when I have an opponent. Not so helpful in Kansas. And as you point out, you know, Governor Brownback had a very aggressive tax cut program that hit education and other government services. And, and that's why he's at it. Last time I checked, 44%, around 44% re-elect. It's tied or even he's down a couple of points. We don't get involved usually in governor's races. We leave that for our friends in the state and local chamber community. But isn't it interesting that in a state that is as bright red as Kansas and as conservative as Kansas on an issue that conservatives, broad brush, support tax reform, I think it is an important message to go back to what Tip O'Neill used to say, which is all politics is local. And when people begin to overreach, um, they, they get into to real trouble. And I think that, you know, Mississippi was an example of that, as Austin talked about in the beginning. But you know, we could have a situation where a Republican incumbent Senate, senator goes down, uh, as well as uh, who would chair the Agriculture Committee, as well as uh, a very popular former senator who went home to run for governor to perhaps one day at the time thought about running for president of the United States. So I think it is, after every election, there are always surprises. Think about Eric Cantor. Who would in the world ever pick the idea that Eric Cantor would lose re-election as the House Majority Leader. There are always surprises in both sides of the aisle. My, my view of it is it's important to study. That's why on the Senate side, I mentioned the four states that I'm going to study very carefully, win, lose, or draw, and talk to people in both campaigns afterwards to learn. That's what we do uh, when it's over to make the program better. I'm also, I balance that with the idea of it's always hard to, to, to take one example that fits into one state with one set of facts at one moment in time and apply it to a governor's race in New Hampshire, where the people and the policies and the history is different. But I do think it's exceptionally notable, particularly if we're about to get involved in, we are in a Republican nominating process where tax issues will be uh, front and center. So it's going to impact the Senate race, and we're polling it very carefully. Went up with an ad yes, two days ago. Let me ask this. Is Terry, did Terry Benham leave? Is Terry Kent? Where's Terry? I think he had to sneak had to out. He had leave. a board meeting. No, we got, we got a bunch of questions. You guys come up here individually and ask Ron. I know several of the students want to ask Rob because they want to cite him in their paper about the elections. <laughs> and it would be a good site, and I would encourage them to do it. Let's, uh, let's give uh, Rob Ingstrom a, a round. Thank you very much.